Looking back over my life, if I haven't learned anything else and all that I have endured, overcome, and lived to talk about with those who are also survivors, I have learned to breathe life into my story. I refuse to live my life dying inside while trying to keep so much pain buried within me for the sake of sparing the feelings of others. The darkness that surrounds what happened to my birth mother at the tender age of 13 years old at the hands of her birth father wasn't all dark. Yes, I was conceived in the midst of darkness, but I was born to be a light in this world. More specifically, I have been called and equipped by God to help free others in similar situations. My extremely large family is divided over this issue and the need for me, and as I have learned in the last few years, other family members with a similar story to no longer be silent. Yes, this isn't about them. It is about me and my refusal to continue being the family secret. I was around 12 years old when my birth mother sat me down and told me a story that I can never unhear, unfeel, or unknow. The story she shared with me erased the little bit of hope I had to one day be rescued from the house of horrors I was living in. The only solace I had from the constant physical and emotional abuse I was subjected to on a daily basis was what I now refer to as sleepscaping. I would spend my nights dreaming that my father would come find me one day and rescue me, and in doing so, I would live happily ever after, and I never had to worry about being beaten or sexually abused ever again. In my dreams, he went from being Magic Johnson to Ice-T to Denzel Washington to someone who wasn't even famous but was well off and would be able to protect me and give me the life I deserved. Yet, as I was listening to my birth mother tell me this horrific story about how she was sent to visit her own father, and during that visit, he had begun to rape her, I was sickened. She was my age. Why would a grown man want to sleep with a kid? So many things were running through my young mind. It was like puzzle pieces falling out of the sky as she continued to talk. Memories of the way that man's wife used to treat me, how she never called me Lakeisha. It was always that girl. Or how my friends back in Michigan would get mad at me and say things like, that's why you and your mom got the same daddy. That really got me, because why would my friends have known that when I didn't? The more she talked, the less I remembered as the falling puzzle pieces got heavier and heavier. So many times I had asked about who my father was, and so many times I was simply ignored. My brother had his dad, my sister had hers, and the monstrous kids he had with my mom had him. But I was never aware of who my father was. Looking back, I don't know what would have been worse, the pain of not knowing or the harsh reality of finding out that I was doomed to a life with which there was no escaping, or so I thought at the time. Above and beyond anything I left that conversation with was the painful realization that I was the family secret. In the weeks that followed the conversation, we made a trip to St. Louis, Missouri, where I was subjected to a blood test that would later confirm what I had been told. I found out after the fact the test was needed so that my mother could begin receiving RSDI benefits on my behalf because her father, our father, had been diagnosed with cancer and was dying. I also found out that the brother I had no real memory of because he had been given up for adoption as a small child and born only 13 months after I was, was also his child. Yet, there was also a girl who was not the child of my father's wife, who was born two months after my brother. He had plenty of adult children, with my mother being in the middle, but he also had three minor children. Not only was my mother raped twice by her own father, but this man was also having an extramarital affair. In my late 30s, I would learn that he was also raping his niece, with whom he had a son with, who was not much younger than me. The physical and emotional abuse I was enduring was bad enough, but to have to go through the kind of psychological trauma I was being forced to take on was seemingly too much for one kid to handle. Yet, I had no choice but to endure it. I had so many questions 
that I wouldn't dare ask because I came from a household that earned me beatings just for looking like I was thinking something that was disrespectful. I don't know if my birth mother actually took me into consideration when deciding to talk to me about my conception or if she even cared about how that information would affect me. What I knew for sure was that I was hanging on to life by a thread and with each day, the desire to live was shriveling more and more each day. There were so many secrets that were finally being revealed. Secrets that I wish I could have forced back into their boxes. After the last beating I endured, I had reached my limit on life and simply didn't care anymore about consequences. I had already lied to Child Protective Services in Michigan about the abuse I was enduring out of fear. And that lie paved the way for me to be taken to Mississippi, where according to the monster, white folks mind their own business. However, with the revealing of family secrets and the new reality that I would never be rescued by my perfect father, I had to save myself or risk going back into that hellhole and possibly killing the monster or my birth mom or the both of them. Their last fight involved a gun and I had witnessed where he threw it after he took it from her and beat her with it. The beating I endured that morning after the fight with the gun involved was my last straw. I couldn't take it anymore. Barely able to sit down from the swollen and bloody welt marks all over my body, I had finally had enough. The day I left their home was the day I ended up in the foster care system. And go figure, it was two white women, the only two in the entire school, who I trusted with my truth, and they called CPS. Here I am 30 years later at 43 years old, and the truth of my conception still hangs over my head. It isn't as daunting as it once was, but it definitely is there. More so than anything else at this point in my life is the question of why. Why was my father slash grandfather never prosecuted? Why was my birth mother sent back there the next summer for it to happen again? Why is it that as the elders began to die in my family, the more I learn that I am unfortunately not the only one like me, born through rape and molestation of young girls in my family by their brothers, dads, and stepdads alike. This is sickening to say the least, and the more that I find out, I'm not comforted, I'm disgusted. Why are so many secrets kept when it is clear that secrets only protect the abusers and allow them to continue to abuse more and more young girls who are seemingly led right to them by their own mothers, aunts, and older cousins? I won't tell my birth mother story for her, but it is hard to be angry with her for the abuse she subjected me to as a child and the abuse she continues to subject me to as recent as October 6, 2022, via an email she sent to the director of my documentary. It is hard because as my older cousins begin to talk and share, the picture that is painted of the abuses they all suffered is horrific at best. I watched the Jeffrey Dahmer series, and unlike many, I didn't cry. I didn't cry because I watched it from the perspective of the systemic failures that allowed him to do what he did for so long. The same is true within my family. Why was the pedophilia allowed to go on for so long? Why weren't the perpetrators called out, prosecuted, and kept from children? Why are my grandmother's brothers nervous at the thought of me writing a book, but comfortable enough to come to me and tell me not to tell it all? I know why. The why is because they don't think me speaking out will actually happen, but they couldn't be more wrong than they are. I have been speaking out. I will continue to speak out. And I will never allow the secrecy surrounding my conception to darken my life anymore. In the years that I have grown more and more vocal, I have heard story after story after story of the same thing happening in other families. In Mississippi alone, I was connected to two families where I would later find out the dads in both families was raping his daughters and in one family molesting his young grandchildren. Like my family, the secrecy shrouding the abuse is what allowed it to go on for so long. But that needs to end. Women and girls who have been victimized by family members or are like me and are the products of those rapes need to know that they don't have to be quiet anymore. You're not alone. You don't have to live with this secret any longer. I found my healing in telling my story and I want to spend the rest of my life helping other women find their own healing through unspoken familial revelations that should no longer be the secret that keep us bound and chained to trauma we were never supposed to carry. I am not my family's secret anymore. 
I am the living evidence of what happens when secrets are kept. Yet I am also the living example of what can happen when someone refuses to accept a hand dealt to them in darkness. I was neither conceived nor born into the light, but by the grace of God, I have indeed become the light, shining on this ugly secret that needs to be uncovered once and for all. The last 43 years of my life have included severe physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional and psychological abuse, many suicide attempts, and regular bouts of depression. Within the last few years, I have learned how to channel that dark energy and use it for my good, the good of others, and most importantly, God's greater good, as I now understand his purpose and plan for my life.